Welcome to everyone joining us for today's LinkedIn Live, hosted by myself, Aman Kidwai. We're here because the past few years have transformed work as we know it. We've been reimagining how, when, and where we work with the rise of remote and hybrid workplaces. Although more businesses have recently called their employees back to the office, there's a genie that can't be put back into the bottle. Remote and hybrid workforces feel like a shift that's here to stay. Today, we're hearing about brand new joint research from Nick Bloom, Stanford economics professor and founder of WFH Research, and Luke Pardue, economist at Gusto. We'll also hear about best practices and on hybrid work from Lisa Khan, CEO of GatherAround. Again, I'm Aman Kidwai, journalist, I've been covering the future of work for a few years now, formerly at Morning Brew, Fortune, and Business Insider. And I'll let my fellow speakers introduce themselves, starting with Nick. Hi, I'm uh, Nick Bloom, very happy to be here. I'm from Stanford University and uh, have been working on working from home for 20 years. But I have to say people are only that interested in it after uh, March 2020. Uh, nice to be here. Lisa, you want to go? Yeah, I'm Lisa Khan. I'm the co-founder and CEO of GatherRound. Um, we are ourselves a 100% remote company, so I have this lens of leading a remote team. And also our software, our product, our technology is about enabling remote and hybrid teams like Calendly. Gusto is one of our customers and Lyft to actually elevate their culture through interactive, inclusive video meetings. I'll also mention my sort of third hat is that I am a new mother um, and I recently kickstarted a pretty widespread discussion about the feminist case for remote work after I posted a photo of myself nursing my then newborn at this very desk during a video meeting went viral. Um, so really excited for today's conversation. Thanks for having me. And then Luke. Awesome. Thanks, Amana. My name is Luke Pardue. I am an economist on Gusto's economic research team. I have the great privilege of researching small business trends from pay and hiring to entrepreneurship and new business starts and also remote and hybrid work trends. Although I have to say I've been doing that for the last few years, not quite for 20 years, but I'm happy <laughs> to be here in conversation with Nick and Lisa. Wonderful. So now that we've had our introductions, uh, just for the audience, want to encourage folks to drop questions in the chat section as you have them. We'll be taking questions at the end of, a session, of the session, so don't hesitate to jump in and ask. We'll try to get to as many of them as possible. Also wanted to note that this is the first of three LinkedIn live sessions that we'll be having around remote and hybrid work, including working with remote employees around the world. Don't forget to check out our other sessions. You can head to the link in the comments on this page uh, to learn about those other conversations. Uh, so without further ado, we'll hand it off now to Nick and Luke. Thanks. I'm happy to share my screen right now where we'll display some findings from research that Nick and I have been doing between Gusto and the work from home research team at Stanford University. And um, what we've been looking at is remote and hybrid work trends among the 300,000 plus small and mid-sized businesses that use Gusto. And we looked at one specific way in which the relationship between employees work and their home life have, their home lives have changed in, in one measure, which has been the distance, the physical distance between their home and their work. And we looked at this from pre-pandemic times from about 2018 onwards to uh, August of 2023. And so we really have some of the most recent data on remote work trends here right now. And this slide that I'm displaying right now looks at overall across these 300,000 plus small businesses, how this measure has changed and how it's changed is that employees are living further from their work today than they were at any point in this data. We see in 2018 and, and even up right until the pandemic, employees lived about nine miles on average from their work. They're relatively close. And I think there's two interesting things that have happened since, which is first, this really large increase in the distance from uh, from work that employees live right now, starting just as the, the sort of pandemic started and, and employees started to move away or businesses looked to hire farther away. And then the second thing is looking recently, we're starting to see a bit of a leveling off of that trend, but it hasn't, it hasn't first of all, it hasn't certainly decreased, but it also hasn't, um, leveled off all that much. And I, I think what, what's interesting is just in terms of how these remote work trends are going to pan out now that we're three years on from the pandemic, seeing how uh, we're, start, we're still seeing an increase, though somewhat smaller, I think is, is a relatively encouraging trend for, for those who think remote work is here to stay. 
I'll throw it over um, to Nick for, for some initial reactions and also how you think this has complemented some of the work that you've been doing with the work from home team. Yeah, so Luke, this is fascinating data. So just for everyone to get their heads around, um, what this comes from is payroll data. And when you do payroll, you have to say where you live. But you also have to say where your employer is. And from between those two, we can figure out how far you are from work. And that tends to be pretty accurate because it affects taxes. Uh, you need it for you know, legal and compliance reasons to have a correct number. Now, one question is you notice it's been rising since 2020. What that's really telling us is early in the pandemic, we know a lot of people moved out from the city centers out to the suburbs, what's been called the donut effect. Many of them look like they weren't at that point updating their address. And what that probably implies is they weren't sure it's permanent. So, you know, if in uh, April, May 2020, I uh, decide, look, I'm, I'm now fully remote for a bit at least because my employers told me to go home. I moved to, I don't know, you know, the beach or uh, Tahoe or Idaho or somewhere. It looks like many folks thought, well, it's not going to last. I'm not going to update my address. What we can see over the last three years, up to the data Luke just showed up to August 2023, is that gap's going up and up. And it's kind of flattening off now, which tells you that by now, summer, fall 2023, folks are saying, you know, this is permanent. This work from home thing is here to stay. Probably they've moved address. They've, you know, changed rent. They've bought and sold their house. They've permanently moved out. And secondly, the numbers are huge. So that's a doubling of distance. That is an enormous number. So, you know, it's gone from nine to 18 miles. That's just, that's not a small change. So most people are now living twice as far away as they were pre-pandemic. Some of that is like to be hybrid. So folks, you know, say only going into the office two, three days a week. And some of that will be fully remote. And some people have moved quite a long way away. Yeah, just to start to add, this data is so telling. But I think just to add some sort of anecdotal, maybe bring it to some stories. For those of you that are watching, if you remember when this all started, March of 2020, we were told oh, we're going to stay home for two weeks. So you probably didn't move or change your lifestyle for those two weeks. And then it was another two weeks and then another few months. And then several years later, a lot of people moved. You had this very expensive rent or mortgage, potentially. You had a long commute to an office. You know, prior to starting Gather Round, I worked at Meta and I had a 90 minute commute each way. If I didn't have to do that, why would I live in San Francisco and spend $5,000 a month on rent? So just to sort of make this concrete for you all, and I'm sure many of you that are listening right now had this experience. You moved to either have more space because suddenly you were working at home um, to reduce your cost of living or for a variety of other reasons. Maybe you had a sick relative that you needed to move to take care of. Um, and so when I talk to our customers, this is one of the primary reasons they come to us because they say, well, we were all in office in this city in New York or whatever. And then during the pandemic, we allowed people to move wherever they wanted to move. And now 50 percent of people are over the country, all over the world. Um, but we're now back to office. And so the 50 percent that are close enough to the office have to come in and everybody else can work from home. And then they mention, oh, well, but when we get our employee engagement surveys back, we find that there is a mismatch in how connected, engaged um, and supported these two segments start to feel. So this is something that I'm sure all of you that are listening and watching this have some story, whether it's yours or a colleague or someone that you know. Um, and I will just share the vast majority of the companies that we talk to feel the pain of this exact situation. Definitely. One thing jumping in, I think it's interesting to think about the two, and we'll talk about this later, the two different um, ways that, that we're seeing this, this sort of distance increase, which um, which I can see in, in some of the, the questions here, which is, first of all, um, you know, we're starting to see, Nick alluded to, this donut effect where people who used to live in the downtowns are now living a little bit farther away from the office, but still in, say, the same metropolitan area and maybe even commuting in one or two days a week. Um, but then what's interesting also is to see the rise of what we might call, um, you know, First of all, to see the rise of totally remote workers who live across the country and are maybe even, say, super commuters that kind of come in once a quarter, maybe maybe even once a month. And, and so there, there is a sort of gradual increase of people moving out but living in the same city, but then also the um, uh, the sort of much broader increase in large distances that people um, are kind of moving away. They might move across the country and still work on a, on a coastal area or move to the middle of the country and work on, on either of the coasts. And so this, this data really captures both of the ways in which the remote work uh, kind of 
transformation is changing the economy and the economic geography of the country. Great. I think, uh, sure. Nick, can you explain this next slide for us? Sure thing. And I think Nick is, uh, Nick is going to walk us through this one right now. Yeah, so um, another fascinating slide. I should say this is hot off the press. So, uh, you know, we spent much of the weekend, uh, you know, the four of us had a, a, a pre-meet last week. We saw draft slides, but this is, you know, this is first time live premiere in the uh, public domain. So um, this slide breaks it down on the left by income on the right by industry. So on the left, what we have seen is this massive divide over who gets to work from home and who doesn't. So and I've talked to folks over and over again. I've heard from managers, you know, exec CEOs, head of HR, saying, look, some folks in the organization that typically the higher end managers, professionals, people with a university degree, they've got to work from home. Frontline staff haven't. And you really see this very clearly on the left graph. So what it shows you is folks lucky enough to earn, you know, 250000 or a quarter of a million dollars or more a year. They have seen the biggest increase in distance to work. So their distance to work has tripled, which is huge, which tells you a whole bunch of them are moving way out into the suburbs or have gone fully remote and are moving, you know, typically, typically, by the way, the fully remote, come back to what Lisa said, folks often don't leave the whole region. They just move maybe 100 or 200 miles away. So they're kind of within striking distance of coming in once every other two, three weeks if you're having an offsite. You look at folks 150 to 250, they've more than doubled. 100 to 150, they've kind of doubled. So this is really driven by the upper end of income. So I think of middle senior managers in particular, they're the ones really driving it. If we look down at the bottom end, there's not really been that much shift. So on the left, there's a clear evidence of divide by income. On the right, we can see you know, matching some of the uh, media stories. This is very much driven by tech. So the media is full of stories about how tech's moving to work from home. It is, but it's also a bit of an outlier. So that green line, the top one is information, which is basically technology. Interestingly, just below it is finance and insurance. And you kind of think if you read the newspapers, if you hear what David Solomon or Jamie Dimon or others are saying about, you know, get back to the office five days a week or else, that was an industry that doesn't see much remote work. In fact, it's exactly the reverse, and it's partly why they're fighting so hard. That and professional services, tech, professional services, finance, kind of think of law, accounting, etc., industries where A, everyone is typically very educated and be there working on computers. And those two kind of make the ground zero for remote work. At the other end, you can see construction, manufacturing, retail, healthcare is much more dealing with patients, dealing with equipment, dealing with the customers, and you're going in every day. So there's here, this is, you know, it's, uh, it's kind of a tale of not two cities, but a tale of, you know, two types. Higher end folks, higher paid folks in, man, in um, IT, finance services are seeing remote work, lower paid people, and particularly in frontline industries, really aren't seeing much change at all. And I hand over to Lisa and Luke. Yeah, so Lisa, how do you see firms taking advantage of the shift to remote work across different sectors? Yeah, I think the most um, innovative firms are absolutely taking advantage of it because a lot of the data is really clear. There are incredible benefits to businesses in enabling remote and hybrid work um, with a few caveats, which we will talk about throughout this conversation. So when managed effectively, when teams are managed effectively, when culture collaboration um, are intentional and effective, fully remote and hybrid teams have been sort of proven to um, excel across basically every metric that matters to, to leaders. Their levels of engagement are much, much higher. Remote companies can benefit from a global pool of talent, and you're able to have a lot more sort of categories of diversity represented in your talent pool. Um, and then we also see that fully remote and hybrid companies tend to be more innovative than their peers. Um, the interesting thing that I think is happening right now is over the last several years, this was really not um, disputed, and most companies, when hiring, were hiring from all over the country, all over the world. And what I'm starting to see now is um, I think some short-sighted leaders are requiring return to office, um, and a lot of recruiters and talent acquisition folks and managers and leaders are feeling a real strain by being limited to talent pools that are just in you know, X number of miles from, from their offices. But most innovative, smart companies, I think, have taken advantage of this over the last several years and are continuing to. 
I mean, I'm going to jump in on what Lisa said just to kind of emphasize it. This is like an off-cut figure that never quite made the main charts, but it's exactly what she said. We also break it down into people that have worked all the way through and new hires. And if you look at new hires, their distance from the office is rising even faster. So mm -hmm. current employees are slowly moving away. What we see is firms particularly are very aggressively hiring far out. And exactly as Lisa said, you're, you're making use of you know, bigger labor markets. If you're a San Francisco tech firm, and you now can hire people on remote, you can hire, you know, across the country or globally. And I'll just name for us, we are a technology company. All of our investors are based in Silicon Valley. And yet we don't have a single employee who lives in San Francisco at this point. Everyone lives outside of San Francisco, including myself, um, which is very unusual, you know, particularly relative to the last five years. Yeah, yeah, that is striking. Actually, that's a, that's a really powerful fact that n that none of your uh, employees actually live in the Bay or in San Francisco. Um, I do think it is a little bit interesting, though, to think about those the, the ways in which um, some of these other companies might also be uh, taking advantage of remote and hybrid work that we see in the, in the slide. Actually, you know, it's not necessarily the magnitude of some of these other uh, industries, but there is a, there is an uptick in you know, say, healthcare and some of these other places from say right on from eight or nine miles away to employees living. Uh, you know, 10 to 12 miles away. And it might just be because employees generally are, are kind of moving and moving farther, but also, um, you know, some of these roles in these industries, which, you know, as an industry might not, we might not think of as being particularly, um, you know, sort of uh, uh, amenable to remote work, but there are specific roles. And so companies throughout, uh, throughout all of these industries can think about the ways in which they can open up their talent pools by looking to remote and hybrid work. Excellent. And I think, uh, Luke, you'll go a little bit more into the demographics on, on that next. Yeah, I think uh, the last uh, pair of slides that we have are around the demographics of remote and hybrid work. And I think it's really important to take these two together and to sort of form a story around the um, the changes that are on, that are that we're seeing unfold, and who is being who is particularly uh, you know taking advantage of these changes and looking at um, looking at remote and hybrid work as a way to um, to get work done while uh, I should say, you know, taking advantage, or I should say, satisfying the many roles that they have to fill outside of work. And and so, uh, among the Gusto uh, customers, we looked at by gender and by age group, who are uh, the employees that have increased their distance from home uh, most significantly. And we can see, again, looking uh, overall from about 2018 to 2020, in pre-pandemic times, men and women worked similar distances from home, and they've increased their distance from home. To, uh, to similar extents, and this isn't necessarily um, correcting for industry distributions or anything, which we can certainly get into. But then looking by age group, we start to see that 30 to 34 year olds, 35 to 39 year old workers are the most likely to uh, in have increased their distance, or I should say have increased their distance to the greatest extent. And I think the story that points to is parents and particularly parents of young children have been the most likely to take advantage of remote and hybrid work in order to you know, satisfy the demands on their personal and their professional lives. And so I think that that's a really important aspect to remote and hybrid work. And one of the ways in which it's benefited this economy by creating one in which people that might not have been able to come into the office five days a week are able to, to, to take that job and to gain an income while taking care of their children at the same time. Very interesting, Very seeing some uh maybe willingness to work in the burbs be engaged over here. But uh, Lisa, how does this data resonate with you in terms of your experience at, at Gather Round? Yeah, I'll just name that my personal experience, I am exactly this demographic. Um, you know, the 30 to, to 44 age woman, parent, CEO. And um, there are all sorts of sort of aspects of my personal privilege that allow me to be in this position, but I cannot overstate the importance of being able to work from home and being able to work remotely and making it possible for me to have a baby who you might hear downstairs. I don't know how, how good the, um, the noise cancellation is uh, on Restream, um, but I, I can't overstate how significant it is. And it's not just myself that's able to work from home. My husband, um, who is also in the sort of biotech sector, also works from home um, and is also mid 30s. And um, and so, you know, for me, uh, I took over as CEO actually right after coming back from maternity leave, and I was able to nurse my baby at this desk go downstairs and spend time with her. I'm able to live near my parents who are able to come and help because I don't have to commute to an office or travel for work every day. 
um, I think that for those of you that are here, I'm curious, you know, if you have this experience as well, but when you're a parent, time away from your children is so precious. And first of all, I found that a lot of parents want their work to be more meaningful than ever because the opportunity cost of time away from your kids is just so great. Um, but that, you know, the idea that we might be commuting and spending an hour just in a car or on a train or on a bus and not really doing meaningful work away from our children, but not also impacting our, our companies um, and our careers, it just doesn't make sense. You know, if you look at, there was a series of, um, uh, there was an article in 2003 in New York Times Magazine, uh, and it was about the opt-out generation, and it was about working mothers who had left their high-powered and hard-earned careers primarily to be caregivers. Mm -hmm. And while that was 20 years ago, there are so many uh, elements of that mm -hmm. article and, and that series that we still mm -hmm. see today. And I really am someone who believes from my own mm -hmm. personal experience that the ability to work remotely and not just remotely but also with flexibility enable a lot of working parents, primarily women, um, to enter and stay and excel in the workforce. And it is something I'm so, so, so grateful for and really passionate about making possible for women everywhere. That's really great. Yeah. So, you know, we're seeing uh, people uh, live further away from where they were pre-pandemic. We're seeing certain industries doing it, you know, remote and hybrid a little bit more than others. We've also seen a little bit about kind of how gender and age is being impacted by uh, the push out to remote and hybrid work. Nick, taking a, a broader economic perspective, what else have you learned? What else have do we know about the demographics of, of remote work and the labor force in this kind of post-pandemic uh, era? Great. So two things. One, to build on what Lisa said, you certainly see, in fact, in the Gaster data and other data I've been looking at, so we run this survey of 10,000 Americans a month called Sway, that folks in their 30s and 40s, it's kind of like 30s, early 40s, uh, are particularly keen on working from home. And we see it, it's pretty even across gender, actually, for folks with young kids. So the, the biggest predictor is having young children. And we see it both for men and women. We saw in the Gusto data that both genders saw a big increase in movement away from the office. Interesting enough, when I talk to my students, my undergrads at Stanford or MBAs, they're in that very left bar. They're 20 to 24. Some of them are just creeping into 25 to 29. Those folks typically say, you know, the typical, I'm thinking of a 22, 23 year old. They say, look, I want to go into the office uh, maybe three, four days a week. I like mentoring. I want it to be sociable. My, my, you know, the apartment I live in, there's four of us sharing an apartment. Where am I going to work from home? You know, my flatmates are there. So it really varies a lot by demographic. And if you actually go to the other end, if you look at kind of 55 plus, particularly, you know, 55, 60, I see a bunch of folks at the other end that maybe have had a long career, which they've mostly been in person. Again, they typically want to work from home, but they typically only want one or two days a week. So one thing is really important is flexibility is it very varies by demographic. And I think the strong, the biggest difference of people in their 30s with young kids, both men and women, and then folks in their early 20s that you know want to go into work most days. The other area that's pretty striking is Americans with a disability. So in some other work we've been looking at, we see there's maybe about 5 million more Americans working with a disability than were pre-pandemic. And this definition is reasonably broad. If I think of people, you know, friends, family, folks I know, it could be, you know, someone with a crippling back pain, someone uh, that finds background noise extremely distracting and wants quiet, uh, someone else that has a, another friend of mine has a colostomy bag. These are folks that really want to work, but going in five days a week for a punishing commute is really difficult for them and sitting in a noisy office with distractions. So when you talk to them, we see it in the data, they say, look, if I can work from home, you know, three days a week, uh, my friend with serious back problems, she says, look, I've got a setup with a kind of a frame that I can lie on the bed and work with my laptop plugged in. So I'm lying down. You couldn't, you just couldn't do that at the office. It's not just the commute, it's the home condition. So another group I think it's really beneficial for is Americans with a disability. And this, you know, it's particularly you notice as you got the age range, but folks in their late 50s, 60s, that, that's quite a high share of the workforce. So another really positive thing is allowing people that want to work to be able to work, particularly scaling down. If I think of my parents as they were retiring out, 
they just didn't want to go in five days a week for a long commute. But if I think if I'd offered them, look, you can work for now three days a week and commute in only once, they may have worked for an extra two or three years. They didn't want to kind of go all from all on, full on to nothing. And so I think there's multiple dimensions. There's gender, there's also disability, there's also age that have been really positive. And it's good for all of us to be clear, by the way, if there are more Americans working, it boosts the economy, raises taxes, drives down prices. It's a, like a positive, positive win-win for everyone. Yeah, and I think you you address a really you know common misconception around all of this, which is that saying that remote work is happening doesn't mean that 100% of workers want remote 100% of the time. Uh, of course, there's there's so much nuance within, and um, I'm old enough to have started my career fully in person and know that so much of that time was really, really valuable. Um, However, at the same time, it's been really, really valuable over these last couple of years, taking meetings in bed, uh, you know, making lunch while I do a meeting. Uh, so, you know, I, I see the benefits of both. But, um, you know, I think it's always an interesting point to bring up that that, of course, there is some appetite to go into the office. Um, it's just a little bit different. Um, along those lines, Nick, one of the major topics that comes up in this discussion is around productivity. Um, now, of course, uh, there are many different definitions of productivity, but um, what do you think about the role of uh, measuring productivity and how do you uh, see what the, the role or the impact that remote work has had on, on employee productivity uh, over these last few years? There, there is like a huge amount of data and research. Why don't I give you just like a, a 60 second summary? So the key thing to bear in mind is there are two totally different things we're talking about. One is hybrid. So the classic hybrid is, I work from home Monday, Friday, I'm in the office Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. That looks like it's probably flat, to, if anything, slightly positive on productivity. You may say, why? You know, when I talk to managers, sometimes they're like, that doesn't make sense. People are at home on Monday, Friday, you know, surely that, that's negative. And you're like, well, there's two big positives. One is they save on commute. And they say, folks working from home in America save about 70 minutes on commute. And about 30 of them, they used to work more. So you have employees that now, because they're home two days a week, are actually probably doing more minutes. They're not using all of the safe time to commute, but some of it. And secondly, it's quieter. There's a whole bunch of evidence from psychology about what's called bursting. You're more effective. You have some busy time in meetings and some quiet time to reflect. So that's hybrid, slightly positive. Fully remote is a different thing. Fully remote, the evidence is just all over the place. So... I have a study with, you know, plus 14. There are others that are minus 25, et cetera. It's a big range. What it looks like is it depends on basically having it well managed. So the negative numbers come from early in the pandemic. Everyone's like thrown home. You're given no warning. You don't have proper equipment. You've got kids at home. It's a mess or your broadband doesn't work. There's no management training. You know, it's come back to Lisa's firm. There's no technology set up to support it. So not surprisingly, people don't do a great job. If you look at other companies that are well set up, have been doing this for a while, well managed, they can get fantastic productivity from fully remote. So, you know, it annoys me when I see the kind of Elon Musk comments beating up on remote work because, A, they merge everything together. It's like saying, I don't like wine because you just tasted beer. I mean, they're different. And B, they kind of, uh, in their minds, they're thinking of March, April 2020, which admittedly was chaos. And that's not the same as, you know, it's like, Leaving an airplane by an emergency, you know, it's not the same as leaving in a normal fashion. Are they just kind of conflating things that aren't connected together? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, Luke, uh, beyond just what's going on with workers and firms, uh, remote work is also changing the geography of the United States. So how has this shift happened or, or how has it played out across different cities or regions? Uh, are there any that have benefited from the rise of remote work uh, more than others? Sure. Yeah, thanks. Um, and, you know, I think this is a really important point when we think about how how much remote and hybrid work has benefited workers is that there's this other aspect of where has remote and hybrid work benefited workers and communities the most. And, and to a certain extent, we've seen the, the, uh, the benefits of remote and hybrid work to those who um, who have been uh, less able to enter the labor force and um, are to a certain extent less advantaged than others. And then also we start to see that remote and hybrid work has helped those areas, these areas in the US that were behind in many respects before the pandemic. Specifically, I'm thinking about the ways in which remote and hybrid work has brought a lot of the economic 
gains from large coastal cities into both smaller cities and, and cities outside of the coasts. And, and that's one way in which we've seen a lot of uh, population gains in smaller cities in the US as these worker, workers come there for a lower cost of living and are also able to take advantage of remote and hybrid work trends. And so that's sort of one way in which I see remote work changing economic geography. And then the second aspect is the ways in which remote and hybrid work has changed geographies within cities, which is to say that a lot of workers who used to come into uh, the downtowns five five days a week are now working either completely remotely and not coming into a, a downtown or working three days a week in their homes and are coming in two days a week. And, and I think this is really interesting because we used to see this whole ecosystem of downtowns develop in which professional workers, uh, you know, they would come into the office and then they would go out to lunch or go to a happy hour after work and would, you know, sort of, like I said, this ecosystem developed in which we sort of had people coming in, supporting other parts of the downtown economy. And as remote work has taken hold, that has sort of been much less of a factor. Uh, and we're starting to see in New York and San Francisco, a lot of these downtowns struggle a bit. And so I think, um, you know, there, there are plenty of ways in which these cities can combat emptying of downtowns as remote work uh, right, uh, as remote work takes hold or kind of becomes a present, uh, all present factor in life. But I think what we're starting to see is that, uh, you know, these downtowns are, um, you know, rather than being sort of a blip that they have to, that they have to sort of handle, uh, are going to be struggling for a little bit longer as re remote work um, becomes a much stronger factor in the, um, in the sort of day-to-day -day life of American professional workers. Yeah, it's really interesting. It seems like it's it's changing a lot of how different um, you know cities and and even smaller towns are looking, uh, which is which is really quite interesting. Um, so, Lisa, you know, we've we've heard from the economists. Uh, Nick mentioned earlier, kind of how success in a remote and hybrid work situation is quite dependent on management and uh, the practices that they have in place. So, from your experiences, uh, you know, what does good look like as it relates to remote and hybrid workforce management? And what are some of the biggest challenges that you see uh, companies and business leaders facing as they uh, work to implement them? Yeah, so we've talked a lot about the sort of benefits of remote and hybrid and flexible work. Um, and yet there sort of is this sort of two different stories. Like you'll talk to CEOs and you'll hear, it just doesn't work and I don't know why. And so we have to bring everybody back. And then you'll talk to other CEOs or leaders that say it's absolutely working for us. Our you know, company is thriving. And, and why is that? Why are there these sort of very different experiences? And what I have seen time and time again is that the answer is culture and in, in sort of intentionally managing your culture. Um, I think a lot about sort of social fabric, which is sort of the network of relationships and connections that make cooperation, collaboration, innovation, disagreement uh, possible. And um, so many leaders, I say this respectfully, are so lazy. Um, and you think that a foosball table and some posters with company values on the wall is culture, and it's just not. Um, and it really wasn't working before, and it certainly won't work if people um, if, if you're not in the same place. And that doesn't mean that it can't work. It just means that it requires actually good management and good leadership and a little bit more effort and intentionality. Um, when you look at all of the greatest companies that have amazing culture, that culture wasn't accidental. It happened with intention and with planning and with thought. Intentional structured meetings, intentional structured people programs, intentional structured onboarding, surveys that allow you to listen and adapt all of the things that are these are not new ideas like these are all the things that great managers great leaders great companies have always done um but i think we just see more uh clearly the difference when people are remote or hybrid um and so that is the number one thing that i think uh, needs attention and needs focus is how do you create intentional norms? How do you enable your managers and your leaders to be effective managers and leaders? Um, and there's a few things that I think work really well. I don't know if we want to get into that now. Yeah. Okay. I see not. Yeah. yeah. So I think the first is to be flexible, not just remote. Um, when you look at what people are looking for in flexible workplaces, it's not just flexibility around where you work, but also when you work. Um, people do well, we talked about firsts, um, but people do well when they're able to manage their time. Some people 
work better early in the morning. Some people work better late at night. Some people work better if they've had a nap in the middle of the day. Some people work better if they've had lunch or exercise. And so enabling people to work flexibly, not just in terms of the where, but the when and the how, um, enables you to really take advantage of the great strides that remote and flexible work have provided. Um, a lot of companies will do kind of core working hours um, where everyone's online together from, say, noon to 3 p.m. Pacific or something like this. And then outside of that, it is the yard, the yardstick of progress is the work. It's not hours worked. It's the actual work, um, which leads me to the second thing, which is setting clear goals and holding people accountable to those clear goals without micromanaging or monitoring hours. So if you have clear goals that are defined in terms of um, output or in t uh, defined in terms of um, measurable success, it really doesn't matter how many hours someone worked to accomplish that if they accomplish the goal. Um, and then finally, mm -hmm. I think I'm probably most um, annoying about is meetings and meeting culture. Um, I'm curious, people could just guess by typing in maybe your comments, how much money do you think a company wastes per employee per year on bad meetings? Just guess. And maybe my fellow panelists, if you have a guess, maybe you know this data, but approximately how much money do you think a company weighs per employee per year on bad meetings? Do you have a guess? I can tell you. <laughs> I mean, it's got to be huge. Gotta, I mean, it probably depends on the size of the business, but you know, millions of dollars on wasted meetings. So the average company weighs $25,000 per employee per oh, year. Oh, per employee, yeah, yeah. So if you're a 200 person company, that's $5 million per year. And you can do the math and just see how expensive this problem is. Um, and so I think that most meetings, and as a person who runs a meeting platform, maybe this is silly, but most meetings really shouldn't happen. Um, I think that there are sort of two kinds of meetings that should happen. Quick huddles that are basically phone calls. Hey, it might be easier for us to just chat or structured intentional meetings that require an agenda um, and sort of intentionality and in how those meetings are structured. So these are sort of my three big themes. One, not just remote, not just hybrid, but flexible. Um, setting clear goals and having the work itself be the yardstick of success, not hours worked. And third, have fewer but better meetings. Excellent. Yeah, a lot of good stuff there. I hope uh, hope the managers in the audience were taking notes. Um, Nick, on on uh, again, kind of uh, taking these some of these best practices and thinking about how they may be applied for business leaders or different companies. Uh, how do you think some of these concepts and ideas uh, are uh, different in practice based on uh, the company's age and size? You know, so how do older, more established companies how does this approach differ for those types of companies versus newer, smaller startup -y type companies? So I, I want to first say I totally agree with what Lisa said. I have this uh, almost a spoken title that are a thousand, two thousand managers and firms by now because I've, I've been doing this most, you know, most of the day every day since the pandemic began. I'm completely aligned. Lisa said it's like. If folks are working from home, one of the big upsides is they have, they, they, if you ask people why they like work from home, number one is they like avoiding the commute, no surprises. But number two is actually time flexibility. And they say, look, if I want to go to the dentist, I can do it. It's like really crowded on the weekend or it's closed. But if I'm working from home or I want to pick my kids up for school, go for a run. And so, as Lee said, if you're at home, you want time flexibility, but you need to evaluate output. Actually, I spoke to Marissa Mayer from Yahoo about a year and a half ago, and she said that was the big so what. If people in the office, you can kind of see they're typing at their, at their computer, you know, is the screen on? It's not great management. But it's kind of okay. I wouldn't advise it, but, you know, you can manage 10 people in the office as you walk past, is the screen on Excel or is it on, you know, Netflix or the Champions League? But as soon as they're at home, you have no way of knowing. You just can't tell. And so surveillance is horrible. And it's also, you know, futile. It really doesn't work. And so you have to really evaluate an output. So totally aligned with what Lisa said. The other thing I've heard a lot, and again, kind of aligns with this is offices have moved from kind of what I would call library function to kind of social function. So on Stanford campus, any university campus throughout, so many libraries. We have tons of libraries. I can't remember the last time I saw a student take a book out of a library. Like never. I mean, they don't, they don't go there to take the books out. They go there to work quietly. And that was offices in 2019. People might go in there quietly to do their email, prepare stuff, do expenses. But nobody's doing that anymore. They're, do, they're only going in now to kind of meet and gather and socialize and train and, you know, have meetings with others. So the only other thing I, I have in my pack is on 
how offices have kind of moved towards a place that people work socially together rather than just they work. And so that's another change I've seen. Companies are kind of getting rid of nasty, small, pokey old offices. If they're keeping them, they're keeping more city center class A and they're having more meeting rooms and less kind of cubicle land. And then on firm size, the interesting, I think the big difference I noticed, and I think Lisa fits this perfectly, is I'm working with a bunch of startups. And if you notice that startups, I know Gusto is kind of a success, I, you know, you're really beyond startup at this point. If you look at young growing companies that are doing very well, they often tend to be quite remote in part because they're very motivated. So, you know, the founders and the early employees tend to be super motivated, very hardworking. They meet in off sites, but they're not typically going in every day. If you look at larger, more established companies, I have in mind like Apple, Google, Microsoft, you know, Chase Bank, uh, Walmart, etc. The bits of them that are office bound, they tend to be doing more hybrid in part because, you know, the average employee actually wants hybrid. If you survey employees, 50% want hybrid, 30% want fully remote, 20% want fully in person. And also, if you have tens of thousands of employees, it turns out to be easier to manage them hybrid. But interestingly, for anyone that's in a startup, but, you know, an enthusiastic, motivated early stage firm, mostly at this point, they're actually remote because it's cheap. You can hire people and come at least a point early. You can hire people globally and people don't really need, you know, day to day management. They're incentivized enough to get going. Yeah. Yeah. I would just add. So Gusto does a survey of, of new businesses every year. And last year we started to ask about hybrid and remote work and we saw that almost half of these new businesses that were just started last year have started to hire employees in either hybrid or fully remote ways. And, and I think, you know, like you said, the cost savings and the motivation make it easier. Um, but we also see, um, you know, going back to Lisa's point about intentionality and, um, you know, creating that culture of hybrid and remote work, it's easy to do that from the start rather than being, uh, you know, an older, more established company that has that office culture. Um, and, you know, for instance, one of the best practices that we see getting into the nuts and bolts is documentation and being able to document the processes and the knowledge that a business has. And when you're a huge company that sort of relied on know-how or, or kind of being in the office and being able to ask somebody, it's harder to transfer into that kind of remote role where knowledge is not necessarily in any central place and somebody looking for that uh, you know, code or how to do something needs to, to ping somebody. But in a startup, they can kind of create that from scratch. And so we're seeing all these ways in which startups are, are better positioned to take advantage of the remote and hybrid shift. Yeah, it's so interesting how startup companies are now looking completely different based on the abilities and opportunities available to them to, to grow their companies, remote employees, employees from other countries, uh, more, more on that in the future. But um, Luke, maybe uh, you can start us on, on this next question too. So lately we've started to see uh, the overall rise in remote work level off a little bit. Um, there have been calls to the office and we just, you know, we haven't seen that that meter necessarily go up uh, for some time now. Uh, so where does remote work go from here over the next year or two? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to start this off. I think it's a, it's a really important question and a, and a question with a lot of unknowns in terms of how, say, the economy will go and, and some of these other, um, these other bigger factors. But I think the way that you framed it starting off this conversation is really important, which is that for a lot of these businesses and employees, it's hard to put that genie back in the bottle when somebody cuts down their commute time, once they are you know, used to not going into the office five days a week. It's, it's hard to do that. And we're starting to see companies adjust their existing employees. But I think one way in which we'll start to see this is the ways in which businesses look for employees or hire employees. We'll, we'll see a lot of companies still taking advantage of this you know, really national and even global talent pool. And then companies that might be larger, I think we'll start to look to say, you know, certain hubs or certain areas or maybe higher within the metropolitan area. So if they need to come into the office, um, you know, these, these employees can one or two days a week. But I think for the most part, we've seen this transfer, transformational shift of uh, remote work and the benefits that it's given to a lot of employees in terms of flexibility and time back into their lives that they can devote to their families and their friends. And so it's 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 definitely going to be hard to see this return back. I think the question is how much more it increases or whether it increases. Nick, what are your thoughts? What is the the, the future of remote work over the next year or two? I, I'd say my uh, analogy is a Nike swoosh. Actually, I put something out, an opinion piece in the New York Times, whatever, like 10 days ago. Basically what we see, to give you the Nike swoosh analogy, from Mar you know, March 2020 was the high point. About 60% of Americans are working from home on a daily basis. 
It's been falling, falling, falling. That's the beginning bit of the Nike Swoosh, the drop bit. Throughout 2023, so the last year, it's been flat. So we know this from surveys. We survey 10,000 people a month. The census survey is 40,000. We have the swipe card data from Castle when people are swiping into the office. So it fell into the end of 2022. It's then been flat for about this the last year. In the future, it's going to head back up again. Why? There are two real big things pushing it up long run, which are obvious. One is technology. So companies like Gather Round, you know, Gusto, hardware producers, software producers, you know, venture capitalists, everyone saying work from home is permanently here. There's a lot of money in this area. Let's get the tech better, the cameras, you know, the sound. And the second we talked about a bit is what I call cohort effects. If you look at, you know, folks like Lisa or other, you know, people, CEOs, founders of companies now, they tend to be much more hybrid or remote focused. These are the people that in 20 years time or 10 years time will be in the media and David Solomon's, you know, Elon Musk, Jamie Dimon's will be, you know, the, the leaders of, of the previous generations. And so that is also pushing it up. Young firms tend to be more remote. So we're kind of two thirds of the way through. We've had the drop, we've had the flat bit. I would say next year, probably the same as this, but five years from now, work from home levels will be higher than they are now. All right, everyone. Well, thank you so much for, for the, oh, sorry, Lisa, do you want to go into where you think the remote work will go in the next year? I'm so sorry. I, I love the swish and I really agree with that. I sort of mentioned in my intro that I, um, I posted this photo of me nursing my baby and it went viral and a lot of people um, have a lot to say about it, which is a conversation for a different day. But what blew me away was how many applicants we got for jobs at, at GatherRound. Um, Dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens. And when I looked, it was primarily people who were currently employed, which is really interesting. Men, women, um, people from all over the world. And one of the things that I'm just observing is that people are voting with their CVs. If a company doesn't want to offer the flexibility of how, when, and where to work, people will either quiet quit or they will quit and leave and work elsewhere. Um, and so I think that we're starting to see pushback from many, many leaders who are insisting on RTO. Uh, and that's going to continue to happen. And as Nick said, as there's more awareness of the technologies that exist to take advantage of fully remote or hybrid workforces, um, we're going to see more leaders feel comfortable with that. And I think there's going to be a, a, an increase in remote and hybrid work. Um, at least this point, I should give you another data fact, actually. Karen Kimbra, she's, uh, I think, she forgot, she's very senior in LinkedIn, was showing me some data. I'm not sure it's in the public domain where they see both how many job openings are on, how many applications there are. On LinkedIn, you're seeing a huge increase in job applications per opening for re fully remote jobs. So they're becoming much more popular, which means in reverse, if you're like Lisa or any company that can hire fully remote, you're getting a fantastic deal. So, you know, if you're a company out there, think about hiring fully remote employees because you're just getting much better supply. And it's clear on LinkedIn, you get way more applicants. And, you know, basically the talent per dollar has gone far up. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, wonderful. We, we wrapped up the, the initial part and have a few minutes for Q&A. Um, this first question from Will Green uh, references the first slide that we shared. Uh, would love to know if that's driven more from remote workers or people moving to more, sub more suburban, but still commuting. And thanks to Will uh, for the question there. So what do you guys think? Uh, is this driven more from remote workers or people moving to suburban areas but still commuting? So honestly, go, go, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, taking a look at the data, I think we'll, we see two. We see you know two main trends when we look at the distribution. So what we showed was an average. We're sort of like the average worker now lives about 18 miles from the office compared to about nine miles before pandemic. And we we see you know looking at say the 95th percentile, the person up sort of near the top, who's the farthest away is the person living, you know, a thousand, 2000 miles away. And so that 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 really top percent of workers are the people living across the country are moving away, far away from from where their office was. But for, you know, the middle 50%, the, the sort of bread and butter, it is a much more uh, moderate distance away. And so what we can say is, I'm, I'm not necessarily sure if that's that is quite moving from, you know, the city center to the suburbs or, or, you know, maybe within the state, but farther away. But we're seeing that we're seeing workers take advantage of that kind of ability to move maybe maybe they, they 
lived in you know a city and their their family or their parents lived you know I live in Washington DC I, I could move up to Philadelphia and it could be something like that where you know it's not necessarily this trend of workers moving across the country but but you know the middle part of this um, you know the mass of workers are, are moving you know maybe a hundred maybe 200 miles maybe 50 miles away um, but then again a large part are moving to that to you know from the city center to the suburbs and so I sort of would like to say it's all of the above but we're not necessarily seeing this huge trend of workers moving large, you know, incredible distances. Nick, any additional thoughts or we can go? No, Nick was perfect. Thanks. All right, great. So um, the next question comes from Lynn Waldera. Lynn, thank you so much for the question. Uh, what do we know about managing remote work and workers well? What are the best practices? Lisa, you want to kick us off with this from, from some of your earlier comments? Yeah, um, I think we talked about a few of them. So um, I think the thing that I will add is a theme that we haven't really talked about today is the sort of role of community and connection at work. Um, when you look at sort of data around people's membership to communities over the last 60, 70 years, it's drastically declined. And from a societal perspective, um, that has really disastrous consequences. You know, alongside that decline in connection and community, we have a rise in loneliness, which is terrible for our health. We have a lack of trusted institutions in each other, an increase in polarization. Um, and so one of the, the things that um, I find really interesting is that a lot of people, particularly young people, aren't really members of communities in their lives. And so they lean on the workplace as the primary place. They spend so much of their time at work. It makes sense as the primary place where people build connections and um, meaning and belonging. And so um, we talked a lot today about productivity and efficiency and cost savings of more effective meetings. And all of those things are extremely important. Um, but I think another important best practice of managing remote workers well is really thinking about building community and connection in the workplace. And that isn't Zoom happy hours. No one is going to come to your Zoom happy hours if you try to host one. And it really isn't playing Kahoot once a quarter. Um, it's about, I think, incorporating moments for social connection into the flow of work. So for instance, um, you know, we gather and have a bunch of templates for this. So if you're curious how to run more effective meetings that do this, definitely check us out. Um, but at the start of every all hands, for example, you ask a question, how are you doing coming into the week? What's on your mind that the, the team should know? And then people can share truly how they're doing, how they're feeling, maybe there's something happening outside of work. And this not only creates connection um, and community, which you know is, is so essential for us as human beings, but it also creates higher levels of psychological safety, which have this impact um, on the sort of productivity bottom line metrics that many leaders care about today. So I think that's the one additional thing that I'll add, uh, which is best practice is building community and connection in the workplace through the act of, of getting work done as an essential part of managing remote work and work as well. Yeah, just to, to, um, to back that up, in, in our survey of remote and hybrid companies, we do see that building a positive culture is one of the most important ways that companies can um, create create a firm that really takes advantage of remote work well, that does remote work well. And that's through, uh, you know, those moments of personal connection, like celebrations and expressions of, of gratitude and, and being intentional about it, because that's what it always comes back to. As Lisa said before, you know, you have to be intentional about creating this connection that might have been serendipitous in the office. But when you're it's still possible when you're remote and hybrid, but you really want to you have to try to do it well. Yep, we are repeatedly hearing this key theme of intentionality in management. I think that's an important one and um, being outcome focused as well. Uh, all right, we'll hit our final question here. Uh, this last one is from Nicole Anderson Phelps. Nicole, thank you so much for the question. All right, wage increases are also not keeping up with cost of living. Real estate in major metropolitan areas is unacceptable, uh, is inaccessible with interest rates and inflated prices too. Uh, what do you folks think about how th these facts are impacting some of this data here? So ha happy to quickly take that. I mean, you're, you're first off, you're totally right. So you've got a kind of toxic combination of rising house prices times rising interest rates, and you multiply them together, and mortgage payments have gone through the roof. I think this is one of the factors driving people out of big cities into suburbs, and in fact, outer suburbs. One of the, yeah, I, we just 
wrapped up two, three weeks ago, something called the Remote Work Conference in Stanford. It was, uh, you know, for people that don't like academic papers, it would be torture. It was like three days of uh, research papers with lots of little numbers and people getting excited about research. But a bunch of them were on cities. And what we're seeing is right at the fringe of big American cities, think two hours from the center. This used to be land that was like, you couldn't do much with it. No one's going to commute two hours in and out every day. But looking ahead, as people start to move to, say, going to the office one or two days a week, that becomes possible to build. And there's a lot of that land. So, you know, in the medium run, there's real promise from this, from, even from hybrid and particularly for the remote, of using land that's currently pretty empty. It's very cheap to build a large number of low-cost housing. It's starting now, but you're totally right, Nicole's point, that the housing crisis now is, is terrible. And so for what it's worth, yes, one of the factors driving hybrid and remote is people's desperation to escape from very expensive cities. Wonderful. Well, thanks so much to our speakers, Nick, Luke, and Lisa. And thanks to everyone here for joining us. Again, I'm Mon Kidwai, journalist available for hire. Uh, Nick, where can we find your research and get more info about you on online and social? At LinkedIn. I tell you, now with the demise of Twitter, LinkedIn is really uh, where it's at. So just follow me at LinkedIn. I tend to put pretty much all my research out on that now. Wonderful. And Luke, how about you? Yeah, let's uh, let's just add that on. Feel free to, to reach out, connect, follow me on LinkedIn. I'm happy to, to connect there. Lisa, how can folks learn more about Gather Round and follow you and your your thoughts and wisdom? I want to go ahead and give you my email address, everybody, because I want to help you lead more effective remote and hybrid teams. Um, so it's just lisa at gatherround.com. So you can email me and we can meet. And I would love to help you incorporate some of these best practices into your day to day. Well, that, that is incredibly brave and generous of you, Lisa, <laughs> to get your email out there. Um, but wonderful. Yeah, great, great treat for the audience there. Uh, all right, folks. Well, if you like this session, don't forget, this is the first of three LinkedIn Live sessions that Gusto will be having around remote and hybrid work, including one around working with remote employees around the world. You can head to the link in the comments for our page sharing more about that and other conversations.